Hi. Thank you guys for having me. You are already my favorite group because you are on top of things, even, even though we couldn't get into the building right away. That was awesome. So, um, how do I, this sounds really scratchy. Am I sounding okay? All right, so uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to run through the steps of the project real quick, and then I'm going to start the steps, then we're going to review at the end after we're all done how many things actually it takes to go through this actually pretty simple project just with a ton of steps. So we are going to turn a very kind of complex, intentional foot on a bowl, but it's going to be an oversized foot. After we turn that foot, we are going to drill into it and not all the way through the bowl after we hollow the bowl. We are going to uh, carve away everything of the foot that's not supposed to be one of the hips. And if you see, there are hips on almost all of these pieces. And what I mean by that is just the socket that the leg goes into. And if you could very, very, very carefully pass that around. It's, <laughs> it's actually broken a couple times but that's just through a lot of shipping and people who are being careless. But that one is probably, out of all of them, the pretty much the sturdiest piece I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there are more that have broken a couple more times. This one um, didn't actually have any hips, and you can kind of see the difference between the two and the transition from the body to the leg. And since I started doing the hips on the pieces, instead of this no-hip process where there's just a cove that's drilled into it. I enjoy that transition way more. So I don't know if you kind of agree with me or disagree, but that is what I like a little bit more. So that transition, I think, is very successful. Am I in the wrong area? Yeah. I can pass everything around. <laughs> I need to stop doing that. In fact, I have a box of bowls, and I think just about all of them have different types of hips. Some of them are in progress. Some of them are almost done, pretty refined. You can just take the box and just take one at a time and pass them as you please. Okay? Take an, yeah, just take, pass them one at a time. That's fine. So as you're looking at these, and I know the guys in the back, you can't really see them yet, um, notice kind of that transition. Some of them are much more um, aggressive. They come out of the body a lot farther. Some of them are very subtle. They're very delicate. You maybe might not want to put a giant leg in that because it might, was that me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it might not be as supported as some others. So think about that when you're designing your pieces. Um, another thing that we want to think of when we're designing our pieces, can we see this? Do we need to push this forward at all for you guys to see? You can see, okay. <laughs> okay. I know, it's great. Sometimes I forget. Okay, so I have here a few samples of bowl profiles. So if you're thinking about the bowl and you're actually planning on putting legs on a bowl, well, actually, before we start thinking about the legs on the bowl, and you're looking at the foot placement, which one would be the most successful bowl based on foot placement? Who says number one? Successful. successful in your own terms. Successful visually, successful functionally. Who says number two? All right. I like number two as well. For the function of the bowl itself, the bottom of the bowl doesn't bottom out on the ground. The feet are, or the legs, the foot of the bowl is what actually touches the ground, so that makes it a successful functional bowl. Um, how about number four? Would we be able to make that into a regular bowl without any problems? It would, it would wobble, which some people like, but then why is there a foot on it? But if you are going to be taking one of these bowls and turning it into one of these little legged creatures, does it really matter where the hips are? No, it doesn't. So you can do something where the hips are very close together and it might look like it's almost standing on tiptoes. That might be the look that you're going for, the stance that you're going for. And when you're designing these, you kind of have to think about them as little creatures. Okay, that's what I do. They all have their own little personalities and identities, and each one, maybe one of them is a little bit more aggressive. Some of them might be a little bit more curious. Some of them might be timid. I would say that this one is curious as it's exploring, maybe looking over some things. This one, maybe it's a little bit more timid, crouching, trying to stay lower to the ground. 
Okay, I have a very wild imagination and you, you will know that <laughs> by the end of this demo. Okay, so hip placement is important just based on the personality of your piece. Do I need to move this so I stop breathing in it so much? Or Okay, that's not bothering anybody. I feel like it's bothering me, I guess, more than anybody else. Okay, so that's one of the very important things to do first and that's how you should be planning this out. And so what I like to do is go for, go for this number two style for two reasons. First of all, if I decide that I don't want to put legs on it, it's still a successful foot. Secondly, um, it gives the legs a good entry, all right? It doesn't have the legs sitting all the way up at the top of the body and it doesn't have them sitting all the way down at the bottom because that might end up looking a little bit uncomfortable. Third thing okay. is that you can easily get your chuck in here, okay? If you're gonna be expanding your chuck from the inside into a recess, this is a pretty good place to put that. It's going to be a lot harder to put a chuck on this unless you turn an extra tenon at the bottom or put a recess at the top that you're then going to have to carve out the excess to get that out of there. Okay? So this one is a relatively good shape to use. Do we have um, expo markers? Those are Sharpies. Those are Sharpies. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fine. Either way, what we're gonna do is um, turn this, but we're not gonna turn it to the final profile. Can everybody see how this is kind of a gradual curve into the body of the hip, and then across the face of the hip, and then in back to the bottom of the body? We're gonna have to make that a little bit more aggressive so that our jaws will actually grab onto it a little bit better. Okay, so right now, all I'm gonna be doing is turning the outside profile, including the oversized foot, and I'm going to try to make a nice angle on the face of the hip so that we have a good entry point. Okay, everybody understand so far? Anybody have any questions? No? Okay, all right. We're actually gonna start turning now. And because I have ridiculously long hair and everybody always lectures me on my hair, I know, I need to put it up. We're going to do this um, cooking show style, and you'll know what I mean in just a couple minutes. Does anybody think they know what I mean now? Yes. Okay, don't say that. <laughs> How many of you only use traditional tools? like bowl gouges and spindle gouges and other things. Okay, how many of you are primarily carbide cutter tool users? How many of you are a combination of both? Okay, see? I told you, this was my favorite group. Um, I started working for Easywood Tools in January, demonstrating for them and you too know, at the women in turning retreat, I had somebody, I had somebody ask permission if she could use an easy wood tool at the retreat. Like, of course you can. <laughs> but I, I don't understand that. People in the traditional turning war world um, think that it's so important just to keep themselves to traditional tools only. I don't agree with that. If the job is made easier by a non-traditional carbide cutter tool, I'm fine with that. Do whatever you're more comfortable with. And if it means that you're gonna be turning more, then do it. Okay, but I am gonna be using my Thompson tools today. <laughs> hmm? I know. Then I could be all Superman at the end. Okay, are we ready? Okay, so I like a faceplate just because it's gonna be a lot safer for those in front, but what I typically do when I'm at home and nobody is watching, <laughs> what I do when nobody is watching is I will just press with the tailstock up, I've got a live center on it, I'll just press it up to the surface of my jaws and uh, turn the recess in there. The only problem with that is that I have that little nub at the bottom at the end, like this guy. 
I've got that nub. I can't turn that away because there's nothing holding it in place. But with the faceplate, I can get a fully completed bottom other than the carving that I'm going to do later. So I can do all the shaping that I need to do. Okay? So that's why I have the faceplate also for safety reasons. I don't want this to come off. You're welcome. So with one cut that is trued up and ready to go, I don't have any wobble or anything else. So I'm just going to start knocking the corners off. Then I'm going to turn my tool rest and I'm going to start getting the shape of the bottom of the bowl. Okay. Any questions? All good? Following so far? Everybody awesome? If you have any questions, please feel free to ask or shout at me. I can pretty much hear everything going on, especially the trains. that golf ball for? The handle. Just a little. It'll be fine. I think, I think it's okay. Thank you. Before I go too far, now would be a great time to actually check um, how big I need to cut that recess just because I have cut them too large and too small in the past and it's never fun having to completely change your design based on recess size and overturning. So when I'm turning the bottom of the bowl as well, what I like is to have, I don't want it to be straight across. I want it to have a little bit of a convex curve so that I can have that follow through from the side of the bowl down through to the bottom. Okay, that's perfect. And then now that I've got that curved bottom, I can start curving and turning away the rest of the hips. So, any questions?
you kind of have to eyeball it and sort of x-ray vision through the side of the bowl, kind of through that massive hip. This thing looks huge right now because a lot of it is gonna disappear. Also, I haven't angled it yet. Right now, it's still flat to the ground. I don't want it to sit with the legs coming straight out of the bottom of the bowl. I want them to taper to the sides. So what I wanna do is have the legs come perpendicular out of the face. And right now, it's still parallel with the ground. I wanna tilt that up at an angle. Okay, that's why this part's still looking pretty chunky. This is still flat. I kinda got it started right there, but that was just from when I started knocking off that first corner. I like that. This is the angle at which the leg is going to come out. Okay, so I like the leg to exit the body perpendicular to the hip face. So can we get, can we see that okay on our fantastic technology? Or am I at the wrong spot? Okay, right there. All right, so this is just where it exits the body. So that's what I'm trying to distinguish here is just that angle and how it's going to come out. If I still kept that flat side, the legs are going to come straight out or we're going to have a potential that we could end up blowing out the side wall of the hip and we don't want that to happen either. Okay, does that make sense? I hope. Okay. All right, so this is where you would do all your nice sanding and everything, but the only problem with sanding the outside, what are we going to do to it next? <coughs> We are going to be grinding and carving the crap out of this. So there's probably no reason other than maybe sanding the sidewall up here. But you're going to be carving away a lot of this. And to make that transition smooth, you're going to get into a lot of that area anyway. So there's almost no point finish sanding this, like anywhere around the outside. Okay? So then we would go and... Not yet, not until later. So then, what we would do is we would very quickly turn the inside of our bowl by putting it in the chuck, and voila, you have a nearly finished bowl. Ah ha ha! And it only took an extra 30 minutes of baking. Okay, so if you guys want to look, there's a couple different versions that I have here, and I can pass these two around because I'm probably going to use this one. But that's just what it would end up looking like after I had hollowed it out. Um, what I would suggest doing when you hollow out your bowl is keep the bottom thick. Why would we want to do that? For grinding and for the drilling. We want to be able to drill our holes far enough into the hip so that we don't, well, so that we have enough support for our legs, but also so that we don't end up drilling accidentally through the bowl. Yes. That is fantastic advice. Don't make the band for the hip. So what he's talking about is this section right here. Don't make that super skinny thinking that you're going to be able to perch a leg into that point. Because what I have, I think it's pretty close to a quarter inch drill bit for my legs. Um, there's not much room if you've got a quarter inch hole in the middle of that to actually carve around it. What I would do is keep that kind of additionally thick. You can always carve more of it away, but you can't add it on, not easily and not invisibly. Okay, so keep this band extra thick, thicker than you think you need it, because again, this is coming down at a really sharp angle. You're also probably going to want to carve that over and curve that into the body, so you're going to lose even more of that surface area. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far? Yeah, okay. All right, so now... I have my drill bit is hiding somewhere. And I think hopefully that's the one thing that I forgot to take out. Okay, today we are going to mark our depth. Because that's the smart thing to do, right? 
Hmm? I've got my calipers. And somebody tell me where my tape is. It's my pink tape. That works. You could use any color, except for camouflage. <laughs> Somebody laughed. <laughs> yeah, don't use walnut color. <laughs> not the best color. OK, so I'm going to set my depth. Try not to angle your calipers so that you actually get an accurate measurement and not something that makes absolutely no sense and still makes you drill through the bottom of your bowl. That's a really small hit. Maybe I should use one of those other bowls. Yeah, one of them's big. <laughs> one of them's gigantic. We'll work with this. It'll just be really small. So I have a brad point drill bit, which means that it's got even more depth than I want. But really, as long as the drill bit doesn't go through the inside of the bowl, I am fine with that. And I'm going to mark it with some hot pink duct tape. And I'm going to leave a flag on it so that it zips around and I can see exactly when it bottoms out. I'm going to double check, make sure my calculations are correct. And as long as I didn't screw that up, I should be fine. OK. I normally hand drill it because it has to be at that angle. So as close as you can get to that angle would be great. Does anybody have a pencil I can borrow? I'm realizing now that I forgot mine or lost it somewhere. Hmm? A pen would work. Or pencil or pen? That, that works. Perfect. OK, can we see where I'm at right now? Do I need to shift over? Is that better? OK. So. Uh, depending on, again, the stance of your bowl, sort of the grain orientation, you guys can see there's a split right there where there are two pieces of wood laminated together. So maybe I'll put that on the back. And then what I typically do is measure it out into thirds. I make a lot of these into three foot bowls just because um, I think it's a little bit more interesting to look at. And then also there's another really, really, really very awesome reason why I make them into three foot bowls. Who knows why? Three points determine a plane. It is always stable, unless you weight it way too far, which I've done before, too. One of these looks like it's leaning over and ready to fall. But I have it counterweighted with that back leg. Um, but if you're doing three even points, you might, you might not even want to do three even points. You might want to put two of them really close to each other in the back and then one right in the front. Or the reverse of that that I think everybody got to see when I passed around, right? Um, where there's one leg far in the back and the two in the front kind of crouching. Okay, So it's really up to you. And if you really can't figure out what three equal points are, that might even be better if you make them off center. I can't. I think I broke your pen. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. So what you're doing is you're marking the approximate area that you're going to drill the hole. And you're also marking the outside edge of the hip. Can we all see that OK? OK. So I'm going to be extra careful this time so that we don't lead to any beauty marks. OK, so try to center it in the surface or the face of that hip or bring it back a little bit farther, because I know I'm going to lose some of that part on the inside. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was the last one that I did last time that screwed up. No, it was actually the second one. OK, and that Brad point also, um, if you wanted to take your carving tools later on and carve a deeper hole where that Brad point goes down to, as long as you don't go past the point that that makes, you should still be good. <laughs> Ooh. All right. So this is my fancy carving 
setup that I have. Can I have a hand? <laughs> Not that kind of hand. Okay, so we figured that we can hook this up right here, right? Okay. Thank you. Wait, hold on. That one goes into here. And that one plugs into the thing. Yes. I know. You would not believe the number of times that I plugged the male end of the foot pedal into the female end of the foot pedal and wondered what on earth was, why is this not working? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is something that I was telling everybody in my class yesterday. And thank you, those of you who were in my class, for coming. You were awesome and amazing, and you all made wonderful pieces that I really hope you're going to post finished pictures of, by the way. Um, but what I like to do with my Fordham is if you have a reverse setting, I like to keep it in reverse. That way I'm pushing the tool away from my hand. And if, if it grabs, it sometimes grabs and it runs toward you, but usually I'm fast enough and I can move. Knock on wood. <laughs> usually, I, I do have a couple scars. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was rushing. Never rush this, especially with this type of burr. These things are ridiculously aggressive. And right now, this is the coarse burr that I use for hogging out a lot of material. And then I'll switch to the fine tooth burr um, for finishing, but a lot of the times, this coarse burr is pretty close to 80, 60 to 80 grit anyways. So if I'm going to be doing the rest of my shaping with sandpaper, it doesn't even matter going up to the fine grit. So what you would do is very carefully, very carefully and holding it in a way so that you don't run into yourself. <laughs> See, my thumb wasn't in the way. <laughs> I'll just do one so it doesn't get too dusty. How's that? far as I'm going to go, partially so that I don't dust up the room. But I'm going to pass this around, and I think I've got another one that's really similar to this one. You can see how making that bottom transition from that bump at the bottom through that carved section onto the side makes it so much easier to follow that design through. Here, I'll hand one of them over to this side. Okay? So after you have all three sections between the hips carved, now that was a really quick carving demo, and I'm done with this thing now. You the sander. The sander. Oh, yeah. So we were over at John Beasley's, and he has a little tiny one-inch strip belt sander that if you're not comfortable using one of these Fordhams with their really aggressive burrs on them, um, we also knocked away quite a bit of material just on that one inch belt sander, not held against that back plate, but on the area that's unsupported by anything. And it worked pretty well for some small sections. Um, and it was fast. And it was really fast. What grit was that? 80. 80 grit. We had to change. Yeah, we had to change from what, yeah. And it, it hogged it away hard. It was really good. So that's another option if you don't have a, a spin flex shaft power carver like I have. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another option that might work for some other people a little bit better. And honestly, before I got this thing, I was using sandpaper on a dowel. Yeah, for the whole thing. Because I didn't have it, I couldn't afford it. So I had to save up for probably over a year to afford this thing. It was like 300 something dollars. And as a teacher, I'm not just gonna be able to go out and blow that much on a carving tool when I had something that worked not as well and definitely not as fast, but it worked. So 
I think sometimes I'm a little bit too frugal because I had sore hands after doing that every once in a while. And that probably does a little bit too much damage on my body anyway. So not something I would recommend. Okay. Question. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah, that would work too. Also, if you have a spindle sander or um, a drill press, I actually just converted my drill press into an optional spindle sander uh, a few months ago when I was making some cutting boards. And that works really well, too. If you put a small spindle on it, you can just kind of work your way around that. I think that's another process that I've used in the past for this. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was in my head thinking about something else. And I heard you say Grizzly and Fordham, and that's all I heard. Okay. Hey, Steven. Do these have, have these changed since they came out with the new version? So there's no specific orientation? Awesome. This is the easy chuck. Super easy and super fast. And when we were at AAW, we had time trials in the Easywood booth, and one of the people, it's advertised that you can switch jaws out in less than 30 seconds. We got it down to 12.9 seconds from one set of jaws all the way out to a new set of jaws in and secure. 12.9. It's crazy. You guys didn't even notice I was changing out the jaws. You did. <laughs> oh. You're like, what are you doing? Where are the screws? I know. OK, so before I get this all hooked up, I'm going to start talking about legs. Legs are the best part of this project because they're so much fun, and there's so much that you can do with them. And I really need an Expo marker, and I think I have one hiding in. Hey, I have one. Look at that. OK, so when I first started doing these legs, all right, they have a bunch of different sections, and where am I supposed to be standing? Okay, they have a bunch of different sections in them. Um, the most legs that I put on a piece is eight, and the least is three. But I have all sorts of combinations in between. The strangest looking piece I have is a five-legged piece, and it just doesn't make any sense. It, make, it looks like it has an extra leg that's not supposed to be there. So if you're deciding on numbers, maybe go with something that's either going to look really natural or it's going to cause the most questions, because that five-legged piece is a weird one. Um, when I first started, I was using, I've, I've blown this up and exaggerated it for your viewing purposes. Um, I was using dowels, 3 8 inch cherry dowels, and I would just put a end of a dowel into my drill and I would hold it up on the disc sander and I would taper the end of the leg into that sharp point and that's how I would make my legs. And it made it this very strange static piece that wasn't very interesting. And it just looked kind of sausage-like and I thought that it was just weird. But it served the purpose and it did what I wanted it to do and had these very angular spider-like or crab-like um, joints on them. So this is the first example of the legs that I made. Then, and like I said, that one that has the hole on it that we passed around, that was the first one that had turned legs. Then we started turning the legs, or I did. And I think they ended up so much better. Okay? Do you guys agree? This makes it look more natural, a lot more... Um, lifelike. It's very curvy. <laughs> I mentioned to uh, the other club, like when I have a class full of men and we talk about the legs and turning the legs, I like to call them the curvy ladies. Right? When we have a class full of women, I call them something else. 
But what you can do with them is they're, you can turn them in one single spindle, which is kind of what this is. You can have sort of a short, stubby leg that's all turned, unless you're really, really good at spindle turning and you don't mind all the chatter or you don't get chatter because you're super pro. Um, but I don't like turning extremely long spindles, so what I do is I'll turn them in two separate pieces, and I'll turn the top two sections of the leg in one part, and I'll turn the bottom section, which I want to be a little bit more long and delicate, and it'll make it look like it's got a higher, more kind of, um, I don't know, bouncy pose. So that's kind of how I get those designs, but or that's at least how I evolve from the straight sausage legs to those nice curvy legs. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay, all right. So that's how I, that's how I had evolved. So no, now what we have to figure out is what type of leg are we actually gonna be doing? Are we gonna be doing this short stubby leg or are we gonna do the long, I guess a sexy leg, okay? Um, and then another thing that you have to decide later on is the angle of the joints. But what we'll do right now is we'll figure out um, the two pieces because I want to do this long leg. Okay? So, any questions so far? Or right now? What you're going to want is two pieces cut and ready to be a leg. Do we have a question? <laughs> hey, these are amazing, and you can, I know, I have pen blanks all over the place, and these come in really handy when I need to waste some extra wood, either that or finials, but, okay, I have a slight problem, and it's that I lost my, what, I'm looking for my live center. Or if there's a live center available that I can use. Okay. We packed up in a rush yesterday, and I think I shoved it where it wasn't supposed to go. That is mine. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, no, no. Don't do that. That works. Thank you. So I switched it out to the pin jaws just so that I don't have the giant jaws flying around at the end of my leg. But honestly, either way is fine because what I'll do if I have the larger set of jaws is I will just grab it right in, in between the jaws on that center area. And that works just as well. It's just you have to watch out for those flying jaws because they're kind of terrifying. <laughs> 